Hi, everybody. I'm Gavin Glacus, and um, I have the opportunity to sit with Walt Bartman, the founder of The Yellow Barn and of numerous other studios, and uh, ask him some questions today about his life and career and work. And I've really been looking forward to this. Hi, Walt. How are you? I'm doing great, Gavin. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you this afternoon. I think, uh, you know, it's uh, winter, of course, here, and we're all busy inside. So this is a great time to have a little interview like we're going to do today. Absolutely. This is going to be lots of fun. Walt and I have spent plenty of time talking about art, and now we're going to share it with all of you. Um, uh, Walt Bartman teaches landscape, still life, and figure painting classes and workshops here and abroad. His career spans four decades. He received a Master's of Fine Arts in Painting and Art History from American University, and he was awarded a Fulbright Scholarship to study in Belgium and Holland. His work is represented by the Bridge Gallery in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And um, that is the very, very tip of the iceberg. Um, I think that uh, many people watching this, well, people will know Walt from all different facets of his career um, and his work. I think a lot of people watching this might only know you, um, only, by the way, being in quotes, uh, from your work and your teaching at the Yellow Barn and at your studio in Frederick and your studio in Tillman and your studio in Oatlands. Um, and they may not know um, about the work that you did uh, at Whitman in High School, which is the way that we met. So the, this part of your career obviously means a lot to me because this is how we got to know each other. And this is how I became a professional artist. Um, that Walt built a program at Whitman over the course of 25 years? Uh, 30 years. <laughs> 30 years, okay. Over the course of 30 years. Um, that when I when I tell people about it, when I when I was in college and when I was getting started as an artist, and to this day, and they say, well, how'd you get started? And did you did you teach art in high school? I very sort of offhandedly say, you know, I went to this high school with this incredible art department, and it really was, uh, it was recognized at basically as being the best art program in the country, and the teacher was sort of recognized as the best art teacher in the country. And I just kind of state that very matter of factly because it's true. And um, I remember at the time, I think it was when I was going there, you were featured on the Today Show. And um, for years before I ever got to Whitman, um, uh, I would just meet people, you know, my parents' friends and just people in Maryland. And they would, my, you know, they'd say, oh, you like to draw. Well, that's great that you're going to Whitman. They have that great art teacher there. And Walt built a program where, um, he got, I, I'm sure you might know the numbers or there are numbers somewhere, but he got more kids scholarships over 30 years um, and, uh, and more kids won national awards than any other program in the country. And he had just legions of people who, um, whose, whose lives he directly impacted in the way of scholarships and awards and things like that. But um, one thing that I think is really important is that um, he really built a community and um, kind of infused generations of kids with, um, with really great expectations for what they could do with their life, for, you know, regardless of whether they pursued art in any capacity or not. And, um, and I, I meet people all the time who went through it. I mean, who I might've missed them by 10 years one way or the other. But as soon as we established that connection that we were part of that Bartman community, it's not, nobody says, oh, you studied art at Whitman. Was, oh, you were a Bartman kid. You know, as soon as we establish that, then it, it, we're immediately in this community and we have a lot in common. And, um, and just the, for me, the main thing that we all do have in common is that we went through something um, really intense and really overwhelmingly positive uh, where we were exposed to something, um, art, um, but the, the, you know, the, endeavors to learn and to create great art at a very young age that really kind of paved the way for um, for hopefully the way that we live our lives. So uh, for those of you who don't know about Walt's um, accomplishments at Whitman, they were incredible. The Festival of the Arts at Whitman, I'm sure started off in, in you know, the art room with a bunch of paintings up on the wall um, when Walt got there. Uh, by the time I graduated, it would be in a gym, thousands of people would come to it. They would sell work, you know, lots and lots of artwork. It was an incredible event. You'd see signs all over Bethesda for it. Walt really built something at Whitman and then he retired and he had already built the Yellow Barn. But in addition to being a great teacher and painter, 
uh, I think of Walt as a great builder. So um, that's something that I think would be interesting to talk about today. So maybe you can tell us just uh, why you decided to start teaching and how you got there. Yeah, it's really an interesting story because, you know, my life uh, has been centered around it. And, and actually, I'm going on 50 years of teaching now, which is hard to believe. So it's, uh, when, we, when we talk about that, I think the, um, uh, I was fortunate. I was young. I was uh, uh, probably around 14 years of age. And a, 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 I studied in a, a junior high school where the teacher kind of selected me to go into Pittsburgh and uh, study with a man by the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. And I can't thank him enough because he's the one that set me on uh, my way, okay? Just like I've tried to work with a lot of students over the years to set them on their ways. And I think that he was, been, he was known because he taught thousands in Pittsburgh and um, really was an energetic, enthusiastic and inspirational guy. And he went on to, um, you know, what I can tell you some famous people, Andy Warhol being one of them, uh, Phil Perlstein were in those classes. Oh, wow. So it really was very interesting to, um, to have that background. But I, uh, you know, Pittsburgh was a great city because it really, uh, you know, encouraged the arts. And I was fortunate enough to be able to be recognized and had that support. So I think, you know, with that, I, um, you know, I always had in the back of my mind, uh, you know, art's going to be my thing. I'm never going to do anything else. Uh, but, you know, um, it's, it's a kind of a funny story how things evolve, but eventually I wound up uh, being a teacher and uh, interviewing at Walt Whitman High School, which um, really was very interesting because when I got there, I didn't know anything about Walt Whitman. But, you know, uh, when I, I took the job, so it was like it was like luck because I had uh, great students. Uh, you being included in that group, of course. Barely. I barely scraped in that well, category. It's, it's, truthfully, you know, it's, you're, you were one of the ones that I'll, I would never forget ever, all right? I'm sure that's true. This is the, you know, when we talk in those, uh, uh, you know, our, our lives have been really uh, intermingled. And honestly, to see you as another generation of uh, really outstanding, I mean, your, your ability is uh, known as well. Uh, all over, and I think you've established some things that just make me feel very proud to have been had the opportunity to, to teach you as well. So I, you know, that's where teaching was uh, my part of my life. Uh, it is now. I mean, I'm I'm still teaching five classes a week, and you know, having many students. So uh, you know, it's 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 been fun, and and you know, I'm learning every day. So that's what it's about. You know, and I think that's for everyone, not only the teacher. But the students. So I think well, one, uh, one thing in, in that regard, in terms of your your recent recent teaching endeavors, um, it amazes me that you you clearly don't have to teach, and uh, you're teaching a ton, and you obviously enjoy it, and you obviously get a tremendous amount of energy from it. So that's been really inspirational for me to watch. Um, how did you start the Yellow Barn? I actually, I, I don't know the answer to this. I just know that you had a full time job. Um, you had a family and you started this school, uh, I'm assuming uh, at nights and on weekends. Um, so tell us how you did it. Yeah, the Yellow Barn is a, a really, a, you know, when you talk in terms of stories, it's, it's, a, it's a book, all right? Because over the 25 years or so that we've had the Yellow Barn um, studio there at Glen Echo, you know, I can't thank the people enough who helped to support me to have that, uh, make that, um, studio a vision for the community a place for everyone to come and, and actually take classes and benefit from you know the, the kind of programs that we have there but i think you know what happened one day is that i i actually um was offered uh, a residency uh, to apply for residency at the glen echo park and when i did and i got the residency i got this very dilapidated old car barn that probably um, you know, would have not passed the uh, inspection at that point, all right? And um, I was thinking to myself, how oh, am I going to, okay, I got this residency, now what am I going to do with it? And, and, you know, the first thing that hit me was, well, we're going to turn it into a school where we can really have a community. And um, so I was fortunate. I had uh, Dick Beer, so I'll never, you know, never forget and never thank enough because he was the one who came to 
my aid. I, I was in the classroom like you were those days. And I said, well, I've got this studio now. Um, is there anybody who wants to help me get this place cleaned up? And uh, uh, Kara Beers, of course, in the back of the room said, my daddy will help you clean up the studio. So, uh, you know, from then on, it, it just came together uh, little by little with a, a lot of help from a lot of people. And, um, you know, it's been uh, working now you know, 25 years or more. And um, we're seeing a, a faculty of about 35 instructors, which when I started, it was myself, Bonnie Lundy and Helen Corning. And I think, um, you know, it's just grown as far as number of students from probably a handful to, you know, now, like we said, uh, at this time during the pandemic, about 500 students taking classes at the Old Barn. So it's really, a, a, a you know, a, a great community. Uh, people are inspired to be part of it. And my job, I think, with that is to try and keep that kind of uh, opportunity for students and, and uh, the community to take advantage of what we have there. So it's worked out beautifully. And I, I think, uh, you know, with the help of everyone, like I said, uh, it's, it's managed to become a, a reality. When did you turn um, uh, the studio into a gallery where uh, students could have shows of their work? Because that's something that I think a lot of people um, uh, just absolutely love. I mean, I had my first gallery show in the Yellow Barn Gallery, as I'm sure tons of people did. And I mean, that's something that uh, a lot of my students love doing. And a lot of people who have gone on to show elsewhere got their start there. I mean, how did how did you come up with that idea and how did you get it off the ground? Well, I'm always coming up with ideas, all right? So that was a, that was a, one of them that came up when we were uh, running classes on the weekends, but we weren't getting very many students at that point. It was early in the start of the Yellow Barn. And, um, you know, since you've been teaching on the weekends that we've had really full classes and uh, you've, you know, been one of the teachers that's really made the weekend really work. But prior to that, uh, there, there weren't many things taking place in the Yellow Barn. And I thought, well, let's start trying to have a weekend show of the people who are taking classes here. And it's it awesome to where we offer like 50 uh, shows a year in the Yellow Barn. And uh, we've been doing it for like almost 24 years or so, all right? So it really, um, you know, thousands have had shows at the Yellow Barn. And I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that we were able to give opportunity to people like you to go on and uh, get the, you know, get your, um, you know, get your work out there and, and have people get to know who you are. It was immensely helpful um, when I was starting and I see how enthusiastic everybody is because I'm always in there on Saturdays and I see people, you know, getting ready and then running their shows. It's just a great event every week. Yeah. Um, how yeah. did you personally start drawing and painting? Um, I had an aunt, Beezy Wheezy, who used to put me on her lap and uh, draw little cats for me. All right. You know, with little triangle heads and, you know. I've never heard this. All right. And um, I'll never forget that. I think that that was one of the first parts of it. But honestly, my work always, um, I just saw my ideas come alive. In other words, they became real. And uh, when I was young, I was able to make little drawings and they were, they satisfied me as, as much as uh, anything, as far as uh, my, I could see my ideas being put out in front of me. And, and I never stopped. I think that that started and, um, you know, if anything, that's what the arts do. They give you the opportunity because you have so many ideas to be able to uh, express them. So I just got into it that the life became my art uh, and my art became my life. So it was really an interesting uh, thing to see your ideas uh, emerge. And I think that even now today, uh, you know, with students, I'm doing the same kind of thing, but at the same time, I'm challenging myself to continue to grow that way. So that's how it started. I didn't realize that. And when did you start painting? I started painting at 14. I got a little uh, painting set, all right, and uh, sat down and copied a, a little um, uh, idea from uh, one of the newspapers uh, that I thought was interesting and, uh, and learned how to paint there. And then really got in, into, it was really interesting, got into uh, really abstract painting to begin with and it was more almost mechanical I grew up in Pittsburgh so it was like gears and and um, things like that machines all right 
and workers. The very first painting I ever sold when I was like 15 was uh, some steel workers that I had invented imagination out of what I saw every day. So I really lived that, that life. And I think, uh, you know, then it had just evolved into everything that I do now. Well, can we take a look at some of your paintings? Yeah, let's take a look at them. I think uh, I, I have to run the show here. So we'll um, take a look at the PowerPoint and uh, we can kind of talk. You're seeing the PowerPoint right now? Yeah, uh-huh. So, okay, so we're gonna start from the beginning. So maybe you can um, tell us a little bit, obviously painting plein air, painting outside, um, um, in nature and, and uh, experiencing what you're depicting um, in real time uh, is a huge part of your work. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about one, how you do that, and then two, um, sort of why that is your approach. I think that the, um, it's interesting when I was younger, everything was, uh, came about from uh, my imagination. And then eventually I started painting from life. And when I painted from life, I, um, uh, you know, I saw uh, things that I had never seen before, especially color. I started getting involved in color and I, I felt that uh, I was connected more to color when I was outside. But then I got into uh, just uh, the nature of the landscape and what the meaning of the landscape uh, was. And I, I feel that that is what I shared with most, most of the students of Whitman. We did a figurative work and we did a lot of landscape. We did a lot of still life, but, you know, and also we concentrated on inventing paintings as well. So it wasn't a real focus, but I think that being in the present, uh, it gave me um, ideas. And this particular painting here, I've painted Tillman Island because I have a studio there. Uh, you know, this is one of the things that I can tell you, uh, the sunsets there are so inspirational that, you know, I can't pass up a painting a sunset each night, but this is one looking down the narrows. And, uh, you know, it's more, not necessarily um, it is all realistic. It is about the emotion that I'm feeling as well. So I think that I try to bring both that representation, but also the underlying um, feeling that I'm getting from the colors. And that's one of the things that I tell people. I, I do paint by feeling color. And I think that it's a, um, it's the, the, the thing that uh, it's almost very musical. So I, I really hear the music as uh, uh, W.C. said when he said, uh, nothing's more musical than the sunset. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, this is one of the things that I, I, I've come to, to love. So they become incredibly personal. This particular painting right now is in Africa. It's in uh, the American Embassy in Malawi. Oh, how cool. Imagine that, all right? Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah, so this is, uh, this is one of the ones, and uh, you know, and it's, it is of Tillman. So, um, you know, which is a very special place where, near where we all live, with Chesapeake Bay. So I think that's, that's how I evolved with the, these paintings. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful painting and I've been there with you and um, just the, the sky and the water and the light and the reflection and uh, the boats and there's a, there's a, you're definitely able to communicate, uh, in my opinion, um, not just individual pieces, but a whole, and not, and not just the way something looks, but the way something feels and the way um, one could experience, um, uh, you know, a part of their life taking place in a, a situation like that. So um, I, I think it is really inspirational to hear you talk about this. Well, I think that also, Gavin, um, I think that the other part of this is this is all painted in one session. Mm -hmm. And this is a big painting. This is like a 36 by 48. And that sun's not sitting still, is it? And that sun's not sitting still, all right? So the people have to understand how fast you're working and how aggressive you are and what your thoughts are taking place at the time. And I think that when I, when I paint, I'm in the flow. Mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the things about painting plein air is that you do get that change and you have to learn how to deal with it and make an idea from all that change. So, yeah, so that one is uh, Tillman. This one... Um, the painting that I did here is right from my, when you walk out of my door right now where I am in my studio, if I come out my door, this is what I see. Mm -hmm. right? And I would see this every morning uh, when we moved here uh, that uh, I just thought it was fascinating uh, just as a, 
as a subject, but I'm the kind of person that takes a subject, uh, I don't have to go very far. So I don't have to go on vacation somewhere to wind up painting. I can really paint right from my neighborhood. And uh, I think the um, thing right now is it's snowy out and it looks just sort of like this as well. But this is where the kids stood at the, bu at the bus stop. <laughs> the, you know. That's something I'd like to ask you about, actually, is uh, about the question of subject matter. One of one of the major takeaways that I, to this day, I have always kind of taken for granted since um, you instilled it in us at Whitman is that um, a real artist and a real artist, I don't mean an artist with lots of experience. I mean, somebody who who, you know, has declared that they want to create art, whatever level of experience they have. A real artist can take any scene and turn it into a great work of art. And that it's the abstract elements. I mean, I remember internalizing this in high school and it's the abstract elements of light and color and composition um, and those types of things that um, if we investigate and if we really get interested in, uh, we'll take any scene at all and, and at least give us the ability to turn it into something um, really exciting. Maybe you can talk to us about subject matter a little bit since you obviously lead your life the way that you're trying to lead it. You have a house in a beautiful part of Maryland. You have a house in another very beautiful part of Maryland. You paint what's around you. Um, but we see uh, a, lot of, a lot of similar elements of subject matter throughout your work. Maybe you can just talk about what you're drawn to and uh, what kind of grabs you. Yeah, I think that uh, most of the, the things that speak to me are uh, experiences that I have with the moment. And, um, you know, the, I'm not the kind of person that wants to search out the grand view. I really uh, want a more personal, more intimate view, okay, of things. Mm -hmm. And I think the, um, or at least make the, the, the painting have that intimacy in some way where it's the viewer connecting with the painting. But I think that the, um, the elements that we, you talk about that are in both you and myself talk mm -hmm. about in our classes, uh, you know, are the elements that I employ. So I try to pass those on to my students, but I think that one of the one of the things that's very important is uh, that you, as an artist, you see something in in the the subject that probably most people don't see, and I think that this is one of the things that helps you to paint it uh, well. And in the case here, I mean, there's a personal experience day to day with this particular view, you know, just going to the mailbox that I I feel that you know like. There's an artist by the name of Olaf Host, and you can look him up, but he was the one who just took the same building and he painted it, you know, every day did 200 paintings of it. He's, a, he's an artist from Denmark that is a really unique artist, really inspirational to me. And, uh, and you know, it is about uh, being having a romance with your subject. So I think that I'm trying to give that, communicate that to my students, other than just that it's a picture that I don't have any um, interest in, but the fact that it makes a good painting, I think is one of the challenges for all of us. And I think that when you do get a painting that speaks in a personal way, I feel that that's important too. But you know, here I wanted to really combine the temperature, the atmosphere, uh, the, the wetness of the road, the distance, all right? And um, the color combinations were really, very unified. So it was really kind of interesting to, to have a lot of different mix in here. And I really enjoyed making this painting. As a matter of fact, whenever I look at this view, uh, the unfortunate thing is I always see this painting now. It's just, <laughs> it's like a go, great painting. Well, I have to go beyond this painting, all right? This is very, <laughs> and by the way, this painting is in a collection with a, by a collector that's in uh, Shepherdstown, who I'll just tell you a story. Gotta give Ben Summerford a lot of credit for where I am with color. And Ben was the instructor at AU when I went to AU and got my MFA. And um, it, it, it was very interesting, but this collector has a number of my pieces. This is one of the later ones, but one of the first ones he bought, he put in his, and the house is just full of all of the Washington artists, a lot of names you, you would know, all right? Uh, and, um, I'm walked in to have a nice personal tour, and I looked at the painting, and it was sitting next to the Ben Summerford, and he didn't. No kidding. The Bens, all right. So it was really kind of neat. Uh, so I think that's where I am with this: uh, is trying to go after the color vibration and the, you know just the general feeling that you would get from something like this. Yeah. Uh huh. So then what's, the next, the next, yeah, one, what's next? 
Yeah. Well, this one, I, I love this painting. Um, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, how you arrive at the color decisions that you arrive at. Okay, the, uh, the thing that I do a lot with painting is first of all, just look at the warm and cool relationships. But this is a very interesting painting and I put it in this group for a number of reasons. Not only is it very geometric, which the other one was not as strongly geometric, but this is a painting that is based on the number three, which I didn't really connect until somebody said, do you really sense the number three in it? And you know, that's the basic number for um, design, believe it or not, and the most powerful number. You see it in the triangular compositions that a lot of artists have used. And uh, so uh, that's how it was composed. But then when I go after color, I go after the warm and cool relationships. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm really good at trying to study edges because I know that the edge becomes the focus. So I really build the painting. I mean, I'm, this is a painting that I actually painted uh, standing in water, all right? So it was like, I was in about an inch of water right there at the bank, okay, doing this painting. And um, the, uh, you know, it was the kind of thing that's going in the, in the, the town of Middletown, which is the town that I live in. But this is an older painting. This is the one, one of the oldest ones that I, I have in this group. And, um, the, you know, I've always come back to this composition because it really, it, it just really works so well in the kind of divisions that are there. But the colors, I'll just tell you this, I read color by the order by which I see it. And I really paint pattern. So I'm really going after uh, relationships. I'll, I'll paint the yellows in first. I'll, I'll try to find the yellow. Uh, then I'll try and find the blues. In other words, I really do um, uh, play the relationships of certain colors to one another. But, um, you know, it is that transition from, uh, from uh, warm color to cool color feeling in this particular painting. So I think, did I answer that question for you? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about your compositions and perhaps tell us, you know, to what extent, even if it's just before you apply paint to canvas, even if you're on the spot, to what extent um, you sort of plan them out ahead of time and to what extent they just sort of emerge as part of your process and, and how these compositions come about because they're, uh, to, to my eye, uh, incredibly successful and incredibly unconventional. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I see people who, who, who you might consider influences, uh, um, but I don't see you doing things that uh, the conventional artist would do and that there are many ways to do these conventional, to take these conventional approaches. And you seem to have a, an approach to composition that is completely unique and completely successful. So maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Well, I think that I, when I was younger, I had a photographic memory. So I can really see the, the painting on the canvas. So I start with a, an image that's in my mind and uh, I have a, a good way of kind of structuring uh, the divisions of the rectangle. So I really sense where the rectangle, the strong divisions would be. And I think that the, um, the attitude towards space is I always, I have this uh, idea that you really deal with the foreground first and then you move into the background. So uh, I will put, this, put the sketch in, but the sketch will be more, uh, and this one, you know, I didn't do any preliminary sketches for this, though this would be one that looks like it would be very well planned, all right? But the, um, uh, the things that I do look for uh, are the, the areas in the rectangle that are important. And I think each rectangle is different because of its dimensions. But then the other thing is that I, I look to deal with, you know, just the basic elements that we talk about, the foreground, the middle ground, the background. And I try to establish, uh, you know, like I said, the, the kind of divisions that you see here. And you can see where those vertical divisions are taking place. And in, inside each division is a, an element of uh, whether we want to focus there or we or we don't. So this one's very explicit. It takes you right to the point um, of where you're looking. And I think, uh, you know, when we you study lines, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is color and how color will lead you there too. And I, I do a lot of that because I really sense peripheral vision. So I whenever I focus on something, I take into consideration what that peripheral vision is. 
and I and I try not to deal with anything and make it too complex if it's outside that that realm of the peripheral, you know, peripheral vision. Yeah. So that's how that one worked. And then this one. This is one, uh, Gavin, that I did in the Bahamas. I would run these workshops and I do them all the time. And I think, uh, you know, we do these international workshops. As a matter of fact, I have one planned for September to Cinque Terre, all right, uh, you know, and, and Lake Como. Uh, but I would go to Elbow Key in, in January and I would paint there. And this is one of the ones, you know, Elbow Key now has been devastated uh, by that hurricane, the last one. But the, um, the thing that I am after really, I love color. So I love to interpret uh, you know, the feeling that I'm experiencing and to, to understand it. This is another one that's painted in one, one time, one session. So, so you had mentioned that you like, um, that often you'll start with the yellows and then you'll paint the blues, just sort of go color by mm -hmm. color. Will that change if there's a really dominant color that is usually towards the end of your list of colors that you start with? I, I usually start with the dominant one uh, to, to just measure things off of. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. right? So I, I really will look at the, the dominating color, but you know, also the dominating value. You really have to spend time you know, looking at your lights and darks as well. But I'm about visual rhythm. And I think that I don't want to, depending upon the size of the canvas, how much information you're going to put in it. All right. It's a bigger mm -hmm. canvas. You probably will work with more information. But you know, not necessarily, but the thing is, um, you know, if you're working on a small canvas with a guy, you got to really simplify. Otherwise, it just is very hard to look at from the distance. All right. So I think, um, you know, this is one that's, uh, I went after, I really like the feeling of something like the feeling of water. And I know that paint can communicate that. If anything, what a great material we have to work with as artists, because, you know, it probably really gives us the range of uh, ideas, you know, and our experiences. And I think this is one of the uh, things that I feel uh, is important in my work is to give you the feeling of that water as well as the distance and uh, the play of the color of the light at that time of day and how the light might diffuse uh, an image, all right? So I, and then you have to compose it, which is, I think is the other part of it, which is the, the challenge, especially like the boat that's coming in with a sail, that wasn't there the whole time. You know, and it's like, uh, when do you put something like that in? Well, you're always keeping your eyes open for anything that can make a painting uh, interesting. But then the other part is just to kind of keep things simple. So you really have to tell yourself you can't have everything, you know. And um, and I, I like the rhythms. I, I'm very much, like I said, a touch on music. I really feel the rhythm in the painting. So I, I think that's what I'm after. And yeah, it really shows. But what you were saying about just the quality of paint, I think you, you managed to explore that a lot too. I mean, not only giving the, I'm reaching for my mouse pad, the, um, the giving a suggestion of the texture of the water in the way that the paint is, you know, rolling around and slopping against each other and, and physically creating waves of paint while blending the paint together to look liquid and then juxtaposing it against hard edges in the solids and building the paint up in some areas and then keeping it much thinner in other areas, which, which makes for both a very, you know, very just exciting abstract image uh, and experience and also a very believable, um, a very believable uh, suggestion of subject matter. So, I mean, yeah, there's a reason why we paint after 600 years or 2000 years or whatever, isn't there? Yeah, and I think you're, you know, one of the things, you know, that we are, you know, we, we have to design it too at the same time. And that's, that is the, the challenge, you know? So you, you, the more you paint, uh, you know, you know this, the more you make paintings, the more portraits you paint, the better you get at it, the more you understand it. All right. Absolutely. So I think, you know, uh, how many paintings do you want somebody to make before they really understand painting? About a thousand, you know? Sure, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, I think so. Somewhere in there, you know? Uh, so then the next one here, this is also an elbow key. And this is called a trumpet cloud in, uh, in the, the, uh, the harbor. And I've never experienced this anywhere else but there. And, uh, and it's uh, very interesting. I can go there and I can experience it almost every day. And it's really weird, the, the, the visual sensation that you get from the place. 
So I'm very much like you saw with my the house painting from across the street. I really think of place as being a, a unique and each place has its own kind of feeling. And this harbor particularly was like that. So that was a that was a drama, and you know I challenge not challenge I, I kind of internalize certain artists. Um, this one definitely Turner was a big influence on me. So you know do artists influence me uh, a lot? You know yeah, maybe you can tell us about some of your influences. I remember uh, you telling me when we were walking through the Tate Gallery. I remember asking you who your favorite artist was, and at that time you mentioned Turner. This was mm -hmm. you know back then. Um, but yeah, maybe you can tell us some of your influences. Well, I think that Turner, when we hit Turner is a, a good example, you know, John Ruskin wrote that Turner was uh, his favorite, all right? And uh, it's hard to believe that Ruskin would have chosen Turner as his favorite because Ruskin believed in nothing but very realistic painting. <laughs> right, no improvements upon nature, right? Right, that's, that's how he judged painting. Hilarious. But, but Turner was not like that at all. And um, what was interesting is that what Turner, what Ruskin said, the reason was that Turner got closer to God, all right? To God as nature and what nature really feels like, all right? And uh, I feel that too. I feel that there's a, a, a level of understanding that you try to reach uh, with the work that goes beyond just the image. And I think that, you know, Turner was one of the ones, uh, Degas is another for figure. I think that uh, Degas was able to bring music to his figures, which I, maybe because he did the ballet, maybe he was surrounded by music, but honestly, the, you know, his um, uh, work really communicates that kind of thing. And I believe, uh, you know, I, I like him uh, as much. I also like Soroya for color. I think that Soroya is one of the, um, uh, you know, outstanding painters, but he also expressed things in somewhat abstract terms. Matter of fact, the early, the early stages of paintings are really quite abstract. And sometimes he would leave, he studies thank God that you'd be able to see, because they were, they, I think they were as valuable as some of the big paintings that he did that, that are finished. So these are sort of the, um, some of the artists that I kind of look at, but the others, you know, I look at Matisse a lot. Matisse is somebody who I think has a, an inventive quality. And uh, though I don't see Matisse in my work yet, uh, I always constantly think of him. And maybe in my still life, I, I would get closer to, to Matisse, but, uh, you know, a lot of the sunsets definitely are inspired by Turner, for sure. Yeah, he's fascinating to read about traipsing through the Alps, you know, with his backpack before they had taken the trouble to carve roads, you know, out in the snow, painting in watercolor, and then then taking all that experience back to London. Yeah, he's, uh, he's really something. Yeah, and if you do study him, he is something. I mean, really, uh, that, that was, you hit it right on the head. I mean, he went to, he only went to Venice like three times, but he produced like uh, an amazing body of work, all right? It was really kind of interesting. I don't think he spent more than six weeks uh, on all his trips where he was able to do all that work. So he, he was amazing. This one, uh, this is a, a one in Maine. So I'm about um, feeling movement. And, and I, I don't like painting things that are too still. So I really do try to create visual rhythm. So water, things like that always interest me. And this is a particular place when you go to Monhegan Island where you have um, you know, a lot of artists. I know that Robert Henry and probably Edward Hopper painted right from this spot, okay? And so it's really about how you would interpret it relative to them. And this is a good example of, of, of what I would say paint can do. So I really do try to bring up the properties of paint, which I think are, you know, the, the movement and that freshness. So this one of the ways that to, to my eye, you really show that in this is um, by juxtaposing the motion and the texture of the wave against the, you know, the, the hard, really static rock. And even though you manage to make the rock look like it's alive and in motion and especially by pulling the foreground so close, you know, with those really sharp edges, um, you're, you're really making, uh, you're really showing us a juxtaposition in textures and in, in motions um, that furthers the other one. I mean, if you had just painted the wave with nothing else in the painting, okay, 
but having that wave crashing against the rock really makes the wave look like it's so much more in motion, like the spray look like spray, the water look like water, the rock look like rock um, in a very, very personal sort of non-literal way, which I think is really successful here. Well, you know, it was, again, this was painted, you know, very quickly. So it was not like it's a painting that I would come back to. It's not a painting that I could ever reproduce. All right. I mean, I could take some of the ideas that I have here, try to repaint them if I wanted, but it would never come out like the strokes that are there at the moment that you paint them. And I think that's what you uh, you build on. You build the language on uh, the relationships that you form in the painting, and you know how much to put in and not you know not overdo it. And I think this is one of the ones that I like because of that simplicity, but also because of that energy. To me, that energy plays an important part. So, and then I like the color, you know. Yeah, me too. You can't beat that turquoise, you know, whenever. Right. You're doing it. So then this one. Um, this is, a, of course, Great Falls, and I've painted this many times. This is a painting that went on like two or three years. So we're okay. some. Is this a really big one? I think I've seen this one, maybe in your yeah. truck. Yeah, this is also in in Africa right now. They they, they I'm in a, a a show with some really. Uh, I mean, you talk about uh, they have a, a group of photographers that are like the, the top photographers ever. You know history of photography and it's really kind of interesting in that muse, uh, in oh. the, uh, uh, embassy so you That's don't realize amazing. what the embassies have in them you know but they have all these treasures and now I have these paintings with them which I think is really was kind of made me uh, really proud the fact that I was able to do that but this one is, had a lot of struggle for me so this was going back multiple times so oh, this many times many many times uh -huh. And I would work from it from memory, and then I would work on it, you know, take it back and then come back again. So I would say two or three years. So what were some of the struggles that you had with it? What gave you, what, I think it was what just did you have to find solutions with, for? Yeah, I think it was coming up with a natural way of seeing it, all right? It was so complex that it was hard to know how long to look at certain areas in the painting. And the light, of course, was changing so much that it would change the, the, even the pattern within a, a certain, you know, short period of time, half an hour, you'd have a totally different pattern of light and dark. So I think that that was one of the, one of the things, but you know, it, it, um, it came together pretty well. And I, I, I like this one too, because of the, uh, the way it works and it doesn't feel like it's been labored over, you know. Not at all. Yeah, so I think that's it too. So that was the drama in that one. And, uh, you know, I like, I like going after dramatic things, but this is a different one. Um, and uh, I, I show this one because, um, you know, I, I do like painting snow. And, <laughs> and, and that's because I think we see more color with the snow than any, anything else. Uh, but yeah, those reds and blues, uh, everything that you manage to get into that snow really works. That strong yellow. Yeah, it's really interesting to try and play those, those colors against one another. And then, you know, control the, the way you look at the painting. And I think, you know, it was, again, this is one of these ones that's right down the street from where I was living. And, um, you know, I just tried to pick what I thought was interesting, which was the line of the street going back toward this old mill, which is no longer there. And, uh, you know, I take advantage of elements in the design, these black and yellow signs, which I think would be very hard to integrate into a design. You know, I was just thinking that. I was thinking you managed to pull that off with great Elon, where uh, if I saw those, I'd think, gosh, I don't know if I need those in my painting. And yeah. they make perfect sense here. Those are the type of things that it'd be tough to put in a painting and have them not stand out or completely decimate the entire thing. Yeah, and I don't usually leave things out. So I'll try to orchestrate because I know they have an influence on what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. All right. So I try to integrate them into the into the idea without having them be, you know, take over too much control. That's and interesting. So you don't tend to leave out elements of subject matter, but you do obviously reduce the amount of information you're giving us. Yeah. How do you make that decision about when something, you know, the amount of attention you give to something in the painting? Well, I can read where the contrasts are. That's the first thing. So I really look at where my elements of tension, what I call tension are. But one of the things, just to call, call your attention to this diamond shaped sign on the left, you can see how the colors change, but they mm -hmm. change because 
one side of the, the sign is leading you into the painting, you definitely don't want the other side to, to take you out. So I think that I, you know, I, I warm up the other side because I feel it is not something that I'm looking at. All right, so I paint it just that way. You gotta understand, I keep my eye right on that focal point, which back actually is that little black dot on that building is where yep. we're focusing, all right? And everything was actually centered around that tension. So it's really, I, I also like to pick things like that. I like to pick something really small that, that your eye will go to. And, uh -huh. and you know, instead of the, the, the thing that we know will control us, you know, this is the this is the piece that I think you, you can kind of feel how it's resonating. So yeah, I, I just uh, and then I play colors based on their value and that. But I do a lot with peripheral vision, so I really study what it's like to look within my peripheral vision. And when I'm you'll have your eyes focused on one thing, and then you'll be sort of examining with your peripheral vision something else. Yeah, you you have to paint the what's outside your peripheral vision just like you're seeing it when you're not looking at it. Right. You know, and I think that's where people go have their problems is that they wind up turning their head and looking at the spot, but that's not what you're doing, you know? So I think that's what I try to do is keep the eye in there. And then I like to really uh, bring some tantalizing color like this turquoise that's in the lower left-hand corner. Yeah, uh, balance against those warms in the road. I mean, it's just yeah. a great harmony. Yeah, so you recognize these things, you know? Of course. And then the next one, this is the most simple. I've always loved this one. I, I've always been knocked out by this one. I see it all the time at Glen Echo, or I see a poster of it. Yeah. And I've always thought this is a great painting. This is a, a painting that uh, they actually made uh, into, um, I, I painted it for uh, a group called the Barnstormers when they were doing these barn painting tours here in Frederick. And uh, I went and had to go paint this painting. And that actually in the front of it is a bunch of birdhouses and uh, weeds and things like that. And, you know, this is one where you come back and you edit and you really look at it and you, and you say to yourself, and, you know, the Japanese, one of the things about Japanese painting is keeping things simple, you know, and this is all about simplicity. And I think uh, and it's all about geometric. But the other part of it that I want people to understand is I, I read symbolism and that dark side of the building is the mysterious side. So it's not just a shadow to me. It's, it has it takes on more meaning, and I think that when we look and in going into a dark space, it actually changes our emotions. So I think that there's a, an interesting emotional play here as well. So that yeah, this one is a, a powerful image because of its simplicity. You know, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that because for somebody who's clearly excited about exploring and pushing color and finding. Um, as many vibrant warms and as many vibrant cools as possible, you will often uh, take an entire area, like a, a giant portion of your painting, a giant shadow, and really reduce the amount of information that you're giving us. And in a, in a place where it would be very easy to take a, you know, a really pure purple or a really pure turquoise almost out of the tube and just stick it right in there and sort of electrify the color in the painting, you've really chosen to play that down. It's interesting to hear you talk about uh, an area where you really want to suggest the mystery that you're encountering. Yeah, and I think that one of the things about the darks, so always keep in mind that uh, that's where you have less information, you know. So I think that uh, I try to keep that simple. Uh, but yeah, and then I, I, like I said, the element of symbolism, I read. Uh, and when I teach painting, that's one of the things I touch on all the time is what's the symbolic meaning to the painting. And here you're kind of looking up at an angle that's uh, unique. In other words, you're looking in a, in a kind of foreshortened way, looking up toward the sky because of the fact that it's sort of like an arrow taking you up, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's how that works. And then this one, uh, uh, this is a very interesting one, Gavin, because um, I always, being outdoors and painting, one of the things is that you start to come to understand nature. And I think the more you do, uh, the more you start looking at ideas that, and ask questions. For instance, I always ask questions about the Holstein cows. I know that, you know, when we look at insects, we know how they evolve so that they can disappear against their backgrounds. But the Holstein cows, when you look at a field, boy, do they stand out against that green grass. <laughs> and I'm always thinking to myself, well, what's the secret to the Holstein cow? And then I realized that they were like clouds in the sky. <laughs> right? 
Uh -huh. And so here I do a lot with pattern. And I, I will tell you that I'm a pattern painter. So I really do look for repetition. And, uh, and that's how I build my ideas. And uh, so this particular cow had two shapes on it. And uh, it helped me to see the two shapes in the sky. Yeah. And I think this is one of the things about making a design work. So this is another one where the cow is moving through the field and you're just trying to capture it at the moment that you're painting. And you have to just to be accepting of where the painting is at that stage, because you could take it to another stage where it will be a different painting. But it, there's something, um, I think, authentic and uh, maybe perhaps uh, a little bit more truthful in that you're in this moment and you could take it beyond the moment, but at the same time, uh, that's a, a, then a different painting with a different meaning. And so this is where I, you know, where I have to just play the elements and try to come up with an interesting idea. And uh, you know, this is how this one evolved. So I'll give you an idea, but the cows are always one of my favorites. I moved out here, you know, years ago, and I can tell you that you know, they're, they're great subjects to work with. <laughs> well, you have certainly done a lot with them. Um, you have so many, so many, and there so many great cow paintings and, and the, the spontaneity of capturing, you know, that moment that you are in rather than overdoing it. Um, uh, I think we see perhaps the most in your paintings of cows, because anybody who's ever tried to paint anything that's moving knows that, um, you know, if you really are going for a literal representation of them, you're either going to drive yourself crazy or you're going to find a way to um, to communicate the sense of the subject matter without being too literal or you're going to take a photo and go home and do it in your studio. And um, I think that these have so much personality, but also so much spontaneity to them that um, I, I think that's one of the reasons why people love them so much. I mean, why you're your cow paintings are so famous is that, um, you know, you, it, it really is a sort of glimpse into just, just living the life that you're living and experiencing the moment that you're experiencing and, and um, not overkilling it. Well, and I think you touch on something. I mean, we can, we can try to make uh, our lives more interesting, but sometimes it's just that this is the way they are. You know, and I tend to I tend to be that way. I tend not to try and go any further. We're going to uh, just discuss these really quickly. I think uh, I want to just talk about these quickly. But I like painting figures also, and incorporating the figures into the painting. And this is the other one that's also in Africa at this time. These are big paintings, usually thirty six by forty eight or or bigger. Okay, and uh, this is a, a, a painting at Tahiti Beach in the Bahamas. And actually I'm painting on the spot, but it's painted a small one. And then I made it into a bigger one like this. So um, do you ask these guys to stand there for five minutes or 20 minutes or an no, hour? Just... No, I don't. And as a matter of fact, I have to go after them as fast as I can. <laughs> so it's like, no, there's no way that you're gonna say, hey, stand there, all right? Uh, and you have to compose a painting. And it was very interesting when I composed this one and I, and I painted it, I was in Maui, I took, uh, this to a gallery in Maui, and of course, uh, as soon as she saw the painting, she took me as a, 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 a in the gallery there. And I think that the interesting thing about that was that this speaks much more con contemporary from the standpoint of abstracting things and really, um, you know, playing with an idea. But it, I do like the backlighting of the sunlight, so mm -hmm. I think that's one of the other things. But then again, this is that simplicity too, where you're not really making a total what I would call realistic painting, but try to make a realistic feeling. So and there's an absolute, I've started using the word believable. Um, mm -hmm. There's an absolute, you know, believability about this um, in that that's what's going on when you're at the beach. The figures are in motion. They're not posing. You don't have two on the right, two on the left and one in the middle. You know, there are people in the background. You're not sure exactly what they're doing. Are they digging? Are they playing? Are they... Um, it was the woman handing the other woman a book. It's just all part of one scene that, that we're experiencing. Yeah, and I think that, you know, my design, just so you, you know, if you take a look at the elbow of the guy and how the arm bends, it bends back toward the women. All right, I don't do that intentionally, but, you know, I can tell you that that's a, a, a good compositional element that can connect all three figures. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and I think that this is the kind of thing that I, I do well when it comes to that. The other ones that I do well is sitting in a, a ball, ball game and painting. This is in Cuba with gouache and uh, painting the ball game. This is awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so much fun for me. I can, as a matter of fact, that signature on there is the center fielder for the Cuban team. Oh, no way. That's great. Yeah, right. So, uh, but this is the kind of thing that I think Arch, you know, can kind of serve. Yeah. And, uh, this is what, when I really enjoy being in the moment. So this one and this one, I think this is the one we're going to end with. This one is great. I mean, that is, motion on the guy on the right. Whew. This is this is painted in a hurricane. Wow. So I'm down at the beach at, uh, in Rehoboth and I'm doing a workshop and it's during a weekend in a hurricane and I've got to put it, uh, yeah, we're at the beach. Right? Well, it drives me crazy to paint in the wind. I take my hat off to you for being able to do it. The wind, I mean, I'll paint in the rain or the snow, I don't care, but the wind will drive me nuts. So I salute you for this one. Well, this is it. And I wanted to end with this one because I wanted you to see that this is my personality. I, I really do want to paint my personality and what I feel um, you know, is uh, exciting. And, you know, I put, uh, to do that, I have to put myself in exciting moments. And that's where Turner said, tie yourself to a mast. <laughs> that's, the, that's the way that works, you know? So, um, yeah, so I hope it, it, you get an idea who I am at this point. And I really appreciate you doing this interview for sure. Oh, it's, I'm dying to get out of here and go paint now. I mean, it's, it's been really uh, uh, exciting and instructive for me to talk to you about this and get a little insight into your process. So thank you for taking the time. Well, you're welcome. And honestly, I think, uh, you know, I, I love uh, the, the kind of camaraderie that we have and, uh, you know, the years of, of experience uh, working together. And, you know, this, uh, the Yellow Barn means a lot to both of us. So I think this is, you know, where we are. And uh, uh, if anything, uh, just want to make everyone aware that we have such great uh, things going on there and with such great uh, talent, you know, uh, amongst the, ever, all the instructors. It's an incredible community that you've built. And you've, as I say to people, you've given us all a place to be artists, you know, whether you've never painted before, or you've been at it for years. Um, and I, I went over this in uh, the talk that I did with you, but I just want to thank you for being a great mentor and uh, surrogate uncle uh, over the years and giving me opportunities at every stage, you know, in high school and college as a young adult just getting started. And now uh, you've given me so many opportunities and I appreciate every single one. So thank you for everything. Well, I thank you again. And I think we're, um, you know, now I guess we'll say goodbye to everybody and, uh, you know, just to say thank you all for being part of this. And Gavin, thank you for running this interview. Oh, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Well, we should do this every couple of months. We'll have a beer next time and talk about, <laughs> talk about some other artists other than you and me. I think so. That would be, that would be a good way of doing it. All right. Well, you have a good day and, and we'll talk. All right. You too. Great to see you. Bye everybody.